under the hood in Vision. Um, okay, so in Inurance, uh, what our group and our collaborators have been working on is looking at these different aspects of the visual system and that relationship to the environment. And so we've been able to establish a relationship between ecology, life history, and spectral sensitivity in opsins and non-visual opsins, uh, as well as in some more morphological components of vision like eye size and investment patterns and lens transmission. And we've also looked at phototransduction genes in a single species, specifically looking at the difference was differences sorry, between juveniles and adults. Um, but what we haven't addressed and is the purpose of my project is to look at these phototransduction genes and that relationship to the environment across a neuron diversity. At this point, it's a, a good time to talk a little bit of more a little bit more about phototransduction. Um, so phototransduction in vertebrates is a series of biological steps that converts light into electrical signals in the eye. And so this um, phototransduction cascade begins with what we call the dark state, which describes the inactivated state of the photoreceptor cell. And at this time, uh, a neurotransmitter called glutamate is being released, which inhibits the excitation of neurons and prevents signaling to the brain. So vision is not occurring at this time. However, following the absorption of a photon of light by the opsin protein in the light activation phase, um, this a photoreceptor cell is hyperpolarized by the closure of um, nucleotide, cyclic nucleotide gated channels, which uh, produces an electrical signal. Um, glutamate release is also reduced, and so these signals are allowed to reach the brain, which results in vision. The signaling uh, in the photoreceptor cell is reduced and ultimately terminated during the recovery phase, um, where the cell is again depolarized, again leading to that release of glutamate, so no signaling, uh, no signaling is occurring, and so no vision is occurring which brings the uh, photoreceptor cell back to the dark state, and thus the cycle continues. Um, there are about 35 proteins involved in the phototransduction cascade, and interestingly, there are distinct copies of these proteins in both rod and cone cells. And like other visual genes, those that underlie the phototransduction cascade are also under pressure from the local light environment, and this is um, a pattern we've seen in other taxonomic groups outside of inurins. And so our objective with this project was to explore the molecular evolution and functional adaptations to differing ecologies across a neuron phototransduction genes. And we hypothesize that a neurons differing in ecology and life history will possess functional adaptations to their corresponding environments. In addition, we also predicted that those functional adaptations would be evident through long-term shifts in selection that occur across a neuron phototransduction genes. We also predicted more generally that inurin phototransduction genes would be well conserved, and this is due to their presumed functional importance in the visual system. And so to do this, uh, I extracted phototransduction gene sequences from 123 individuals representing 113 species and 33 families, which is about 61% of the familial diversity in inurins. And we started with 91 whole eye transcriptomes, but we supplemented our data set with 32 genomes available on NCBI. Okay, so I've talked about this relationship between the environment and visual systems, but I haven't really described to you how we go about testing for this. So we do this by uh, testing for selection, acting on genes using models of codon evolution. And so the example that I have on the slide, which is our convention uh, for this type of work is the Markov model, which is able to model biologically important properties of protein coding sequences, like the transition to transversion rate ratio, codon usage frequencies, and then what we are most interested in which is the ratio of non-synonymous to synonymous substitutions in a protein coding sequence. In other words, this is also the ratio of changes in a protein coding sequence that result in uh, the same amino acid, or sorry, different amino acids being translated over the uh, changes that result in the same amino acid being translated. And so this rate ratio is a measure of selective constraint where when that value, uh, which we also call omega, is 
sorry, less than one, this is indicative of negative selection, when it's equal to one neutral selection, and when it's greater than one positive selection. And so these codon-based likelihood models estimate this omega value, which provides us with a measure of selective pressure that depending on its value allows us to infer the type of selection that's acting on the gene. And so there are a number of, number of different programs that are available to estimate these omega values. We made use of one called PAML. PAML contains a, a number of groups of models. The first type that we used are called random site models. And these test for variation among sites across an entire gene alignment. And so um, again, our first prediction was that these phototransduction genes would be well conserved in the neurons given their functional importance. And so one of these random site models called M0 actually tests for the average selective constraint that's acting on, across all codon sites in a given gene alignment, which then allows us to determine the degree of selective constraint that's actually acting on that gene. And so for this, we found that selective constraint was between 0 0.004 and 0.19. Um, which, to give you some context, uh, is very similar to what we've seen in other visual genes that we know are functionally important. So we're seeing that these genes are, in fact, very functionally important in these frogs. Um, but what was even more interesting was that we found no statistically significant patterns uh, between the type of phototransduction genes. So there were no patterns between rods and cones or those found in the activation or recovery phases. What we do see, though, is considerable variation uh, in con selective constraint, which we think could be explained by just the sheer variation in ecologies and life histories and behaviors that neurons utilize. Um, so then to examine if there's any okay, functional limitation to different environments, we wanted to test for positive change uh, or positive selection where that omega value is greater than one in these genes. And so the PAML uh, M8 model does that for us by looking for positive selection at specific codon sites. Mm -hmm. Um, so we did find some evidence of a small subset of sites undergoing positive selection across the gene uh, in 12 of our genes, which are indicated on the figure. So the next set of models, which I might not have enough time to talk about, uh, are models that actually allow us to test between different partitions or subsets of a phylogeny. So they look for shifts in selective pressure. So to do this, we start with a null model that just assumes that selective pressure is the same or that omega value is the same across a, uh, an entire phylogeny where our alternative model is that there's a difference between a subset of the phylogeny, one subset of the phylogeny versus another. So for example, overall, we could have an omega value of 0.2, but in one subset, it could be 0.1, and in another, it could be 0.4. And so for example, if we wanted to look at this in a neurons, we might want to test terrestrial neurons, which we would call our background, against aquatic neurons or our foreground. And the clade models will tell us if there's actually a significant difference between the omega values in these two groups. So it's exactly what we did. We looked at this for seven different partitions that we identified as being uh, potentially important in neurons. Um, I don't have time to talk about all of them. Hopefully I have enough time to talk a little bit about one of them, which are the direct developing neurons. All this figure is showing is just the difference between the background omega value we had and the foreground omega value. And the literal distance between those two is that, di that difference. So direct developing neurons are those whose embryonic development takes place within the egg. Um, and it's been previously hypothesized that due to this lack of an aquatic tadpole stage, there's actually different requirements of the visual system in these species. We also know there's, act there's evidence of differential expression across uh, a neuron life cycle stages in these species, um, but we don't know what that's actually doing to the visual system and what the selection value would look for that. So we wanted to know if there, if what the differences we're seeing here could be explained by a potential difference in function or importance of those genes um, in these species. And so when we look to see if there's actually a, a release of selective constraint on these genes, we do find evidence for that in at least three of these genes. So we think that the reason behind why we're seeing a difference in these species is because there's a different requirement of these genes uh, in species who do not have an aquatic tackle stage. Um, so we would like to add more species to our data set to see if our patterns are the same. Um, we would also like to look at patterns across visual system genes and neurons um, to see if we have any widespread patterns. But I want to thank all of our contributors as well as our generous funding sources. And I'll take questions if I have time. Yeah, so this is actually something that one of our collaborators, Kate Thomas, uh, she's published a couple of papers over the last few years. Um, and that's one of these things that she's looking at more specifically, which is the differences in both people's shape, um, as well as the shape of the lens itself, uh, to see what that is actually, and, sorry, the impact of those um, on the visual system. Sorry, the question was, frog eyes, uh, frog pupils come in lots of different shapes and sizes, and has our group done any previous research uh, to see what impact that's actually having on the visual system? Answer is yes. Unfortunately, I'm not the person that did it. 
Uh, but Kate Thomas did publish a couple of papers about that as well. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So that's also something uh, that our group is looking at. So amphibians uh, and lots of different organisms have these uh, interesting components. I keep forgetting to repeat the question. You're doing great. Um, sorry. Okay, great. So the question was, um, because frogs have these, you said it was copper? We know they're often the copper, but it's like other colors and, and structures that seem rather yeah. Across large groups of frogs. Yeah. So there's a the question was about these other structures that occur uh, outside or a little bit outside of the retina of the frog, and would those be having an impact um, on the essentially the absorption of the light by the photoreceptor cells in the eye? Um, so yes, that is something also that our group has been looking at as well. Um, a lot of species have uh, what are called oil droplets, and so those will actually change the. A lot of them are colored. And so those oil droplets will actually change what type of light passes through and hits the retina. So it'll be absorbed or reflecting certain um, wavelengths of light. And so that is also definitely something that has an impact um, on the visual sensitivity. This project, we were looking mostly at phototransduction genes, uh, which are the genes that are the genes and proteins that um, impact vision after the absorption of, of the photon of light. So um, my supervisor, Ryan Schott, actually just submitted a paper uh, looking at the opsin sensitivity. So those are the genes that are directly responsible for absorbing different photons of light. Uh, and so that was definitely one of the things that he was looking at um, as well in his research. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the question was about these direct developing frogs and that I had mentioned um, that there's differential expression across uh, frog life cycle stages and that that might be impacting the visual system. So the paper that I mentioned earlier, uh, where they were looking at one species and the phototransduction genes, that was actually the paper uh, that found differential expression between aquatic um, and adult life cycle stages. And so what we believe might be happening um, in the case of some of these genes, uh, some of these genes are only expressed in the aquatic stage and some of them are only expressed in the adult stage. So when you remove the aquatic stage, but ancestrally, these species actually have both of these genes. Um, we are not entirely sure what the now presumed shifted function of those genes is since they don't need to be differentially expressed anymore. In order for us to be able to determine what that shift in function would be, we would need to do some in vitro experiments. Um, my hypothesis, it's going to depend on the gene, specific gene itself, since they're all doing different things. But one of the interesting things that we're looking at is genes that might actually uh, allow the um, photoreceptor cell to uh, that recovery phase to occur faster. So it's able to absorb new photons of light more quickly. So it might actually impact visual acuity. So in some of these species, they, their vision actually might be more accurate. Uh, I have a question about, I, and this may have been part of the large slides you didn't have time to go yeah. <laughs> but is one of the comparators between species or groups of species that uh, tend to be more diurnal? Yes, or absolutely. Are, okay. And yeah. I'm, I'm interested. Result. And also, uh, one species that this is at the Herbert Conference I heard about in uh, New Zealand, in Dutton, and the semaphore frogs. Okay. I don't know, do you know the semaphore frogs where they signal, they have little colored pads and they signal in these noisy environments. And so that would require great visual acuity. At times. Yeah. That would be, um, so this is sort of the Oh, this is the second time I've reported on these results at a conference, but um, the project is still in some of its earlier stages. And so these seven partitions that we chose to test um, were just sort of the first big seven that we could think of. But taking a look, uh, if I have any of those species in my data set, whether or not we might see some evidence uh, of differences in selection between those species compared to other ones would be really interesting. And that that might be explained by the fact that they are doing this behavior that requires, you know, the hand waving, but we did test uh, diurnal versus nocturnal frogs as well. Um, there were a couple of genes that had some significant results, uh, and I haven't looked at all of them specifically, but most of those genes uh, are the ones that um, changes to those genes in other species, other taxonomic groups, does uh, lead to an increase in the speed in which the photoreceptor cell is actually able to reabsorb a new photon of light. So we think that potentially in these diurnal species, uh, because they're dealing with more light than nocturnal species, that it might be beneficial for your photoreceptor cell to recover faster. So no problem. I know Jess had a question. Thank you. <laughs> oh, God. Okay. Um, I 
I think it's really cool that they have differential expression. So mm -hmm. you see the same different life stages is that that's being used differently when they don't have those tadpoles stage. Yeah. Did you also notice any differences in expression between species that have like high residual tadpoles versus species that the tadpoles kind of have eyes or don't do much with them? So um, I haven't had a chance to comb through, sorry, the question, which I keep forgetting about, uh, was did I look at any of these um, species that have highly visual tadpoles versus ones that don't? And so, again, that is a really interesting partition that I could definitely test. We haven't looked at anything like that um, very specifically. As far as I know, with regards to differential expression, we only have evidence for that in the one species that I talked about a little bit earlier in the presentation. Um, but I would expect to see some differences between these tadpole, these species with highly visual tadpoles versus the, those that don't. And again, we might expect to see differential expression in those ones as well. There's another question. Yeah. I find it's really, really intriguing. And, and uh, what happens across the, 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 the larval adult boundaries, yeah. metamorphosis, this gets stranger and stranger all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, Typical story in salamanders that the transform is that um, by, by adapting for larval life, they, there's constraints put on those structures for, for what the adults can do with them. Mm -hmm. But with direct developing salamanders, well, that's the limit. You know? Yeah, exactly. Um, all frogs transform, um, except for those that don't have any larvae. But the broad way of doing things seems mostly to just grow to larval stuff and then get rid of all of it and mm -hmm. grow new things. So to what extent do you think that might be true in the visual system? Uh, that there are differential expression genes, but uh, is that accompanied by differential uh, morphological changes in different cells that would play, which would look the same in the test field? Yeah, exactly. Um, that's a really great question. It's not something I've thought about before. Uh, so the question, at least from my understanding, um, is it because there is a difference in the morphological state of the cells between aquatic and adult life cycle stages in frogs? Um, would that have an impact on the visual system and what's being expressed? Well, well, well because the, the constraints of being a, a larva are, are off mm -hmm. on, on direct development of frogs, as you said, but the, the way in which frogs deal with that uh, transition habitat is to simply get rid of the larval structures. Right, yeah. They degenerate and they replace. So, so, so the higher apparatus, throw it out, throw something different, uh, for instance, and for the adult frogs, uh, and you just change them to a uh, yeah. So, so to what extent do you think there is a similar revolution of uh, at the structural level in the eye? That's a that's a good question. I'm not to be honest, I'm not entirely sure. Um I would expect there to probably be some significant structural changes associated with those genes that are being expressed. So um the data set that we had, some of it it was coming from eye transcriptome. So again, we're only going to get uh, the genes that are actually being expressed, whereas with the genomes, we're getting a snapshot of everything. I feel like the best way to answer that question would be to go back into the lab and do these experiments on some additional species, uh, specifically looking for what genes are being expressed um, potentially in the embryo, because we can do that as well, for these direct developing frogs in comparison to the adults and see what we might observe there. But yeah, that's a really good question. I'm Karen. I'm a, currently a postdoc at the University of Waterloo, but this project today is actually an undergrad thesis uh, done by Einstein and the crew pictured there. He wasn't able to be here today, so you got me instead. And some of the crew is in this room, like Tyler right there, so you could also talk to him about this project. And I think there's a few other people running around somewhere or other. But these are the guys who did the stuff on the ground and wrote the thesis. I did not do those things, but I helped out. So I want to start with uh, the pH scale. Some of you might be familiar with pH. Uh, this is a log scale. So differences between each number are big. They're not just little little differences. Um, so for pH, uh, anything below 7 is acidic. Anything above 7 is alkaline. And I, you see I have two boxes there. So the big box, let's see if this works. 
No. Oh, well. All right. So the big box I do around there, that is the common, what you find mostly in freshwaters. Freshwater varies usually from about five to nine in nature. But uh, most aquatic organisms generally prefer closer to neutral. So it's in, in the ballpark of 6.5 to 8. And this is important because water pH affects uh, amphibian development, behavior and physiology. Uh, low pH, so really acidic waters, acid rain, that sort of thing, uh, can really affect them, uh, cause mortality, cause uh, physical and behavioral ab abnormalities. And the reason it does this is because it screws up sodium intake, uptake and sodium loss. And I do a lot of disease stuff, so this is where my interest really comes in, is because this affects uh, susceptibility and disease progression. So, of course, with frogs, that's coturiomycosis, which probably most of you have heard of. It's caused by a fungus. And this fungus and other microbes are really affected by pH because enzymes produced by microbes usually have pH optima. So they function best at certain pHs, and if you go beyond that, sometimes they don't even function at all. So this is really important with disease progression. And they don't just affect the microbes that cause disease, they also affect the hosts. So we have various immune components that are activated on our skin, such as antimicrobial peptides, and these are also affected by pH and have pH optima. So we decided to do frogs with this, and we wanted to see how frogs uh, respond to water pH with respect to their skin pH. Um, they're kind of, Christina always says they're bags of water. So you kind of would affect, uh, expect them to be really affected by the skin p or the uh, water pH of their environment. So we were predicting that skin pH and water pH would be really tightly correlated. So we wanted to figure that out. And we did this by measuring two different frog species and um, uh, recording all the information for all these different factors, time of year, sex, age, class, body size. Um, and looking at the responses in these different uh, ponds and ditches and so forth. We did this around Peterborough, so that's about three hours southwest of here, um, in 20 different sites, and the crew measured them twice over the summer to try to get a little bit of the seasonal effects at all these different sites. Oh, look, I did Christian in all the photo credits. <laughs> that's awesome. All right. So at these two of these site visits, they recorded uh, water pH, skin pH, sex, age, class, and the curved dorsal length. And we did this with the two frog species that are most commonly found in the area, northern leopard frogs and green frogs. And you can see the sample sizes there. So this is a herp conference. I'm sure you're all familiar with measuring water pH, but skin pH might be a little more exotic for you guys. So actually, I use the skin pH probe there on the left, uh, usually on bats because I'm a bat researcher. But we decided to try this out on frogs. So I'm here masquerading as a hurt nerd. I think I'm <laughs> fitting in pretty well with that. So it's a really neat probe. It's actually designed for humans. So I guess that's not really a surprise to you guys. Um, it's used uh, in human dermatology. So they can charge insane prices for these things. But we do it on wildlife now, uh, trying this out. And then I just uh, threw up what we're using to measure water pH, one of the standard uh, probes for that. So what do we find? So the frogs range from about 5.8 to 8.5. So quite a big range there in their skin pH. In case you're curious, we humans are really acidic. We are generally around 4 or 5. So it was interesting to find some of the differences in the frogs there. And for the leopard frog, skin pH did vary with body size, age class, but the green frogs did not. And you can see some of the patterns there, the nice graphs that James put together. And on the y-axis there, you have frog skin pH, and on the x-axis, the curve goes sort of like, so a uh, proxy for size of the frogs. And you see the different patterns there, which is probably partly related to the season that we're actually catching, like juveniles versus adults, and those sorts of things. So I guess you're probably not surprised that the skin pH really is correlated with water pH. So for every uh, unit increase in water pH, which is along the x-axis there, the northern leopard frogs increase skin pH increases by 0.37, while the green frogs increase by 0.116. So definitely a species difference there. 
the northern leopard frogs are certainly being influenced by water pH a little bit more than the frog or the green frogs. There we go. Did that right? But as you see here, it's not identical. So the frogs are differing from water pH. They're not just reflecting their environment. And this is uh, really shown here in this graph. So we have, again, skin pH on the y-axis, but on the x-axis this time, we have water pH. And I just misspoke there, actually. On the y-axis, we have skin pH minus water pH. So this is the difference between the skin and the water plotted by the water. So the line there is zero. So that means the line is where water pH and skin pH are identical. So we don't actually know the optimal skin pH for frogs because they're so influenced by the environment. But I would assume that where water pH and skin pH are identical are probably somewhere where they, they really like to be. So I've circled that with the black circles there. Somewhere in there, I guess they like. Um, but you can see the frogs were found in a huge variety of environments in terms of pH, so all the way down to about 4.5 up to 9, so quite a difference there. And as you see, the, the leopard frogs didn't particularly like the acidic waters so much. You usually found green frog or frogs there, which agrees with, what, which, with what's already in the literature. But it was kind of neat that with the leopard frogs, when you did find ones in acidic waters, it was mostly the females. So that was kind of cool. Um, and the yeah. Oh, the numbers. Yeah. So the numbers, that's just the range of for each species of how they differ from water pH. So the leopard frogs ranged. This is the max and min and the mean and the standard error, I believe he did. So, yeah. So overall, the green frogs were better able to buffer their skin pH from environmental water pH, which was pretty cool. And so where we could take this further, there's always so many directions we could go, but we would want to know, like, what is the actual consequences of this? Like, if they're in a bog versus uh, alkaline waters, does this affect the function of their skin and ultimately disease susceptibility and progression? So that uh, would be an interesting way to go, like look at uh, the antimicrobial functions of the skin and how that varies in different uh, pH levels of the water. Um, so if someone interested in continuing some of this stuff, uh, I was doing a little bit of it in New Brunswick this past summer, but there's lots of stuff you could do with this. So it was really neat. So definitely a big thank you to all the people who helped us in the field and the crew here today. And if you do have questions later on after the conference, you should email Einstein because this is his project. So definitely shout out to him. So thank you. Yes. Um, I thought I saw that uh, in the previous graph that you showed that um, you said that you can see that maybe there's a favorable area around where it's like zero, but I'm seeing sort of a gap almost. Absolutely. Speak to that. And then also, can you provide context to maybe what's available in the environment? Are they selected for these certain pages versus like what's available around them in different areas of water? I don't think, like, it wasn't really like a water pH study. I don't think they uh, measured sites where they didn't measure frogs. So like sites that they might not select. Yeah. Um, in terms of the gap, I think that's just lack of data on our part. It was done like, it's an undergrad thesis. It was done in one summer, yeah. right? Um, so to, like, I don't think that's a biological gap. That's That's sampling for sure. Yeah. So in terms of disease susceptibility, don't have it yet in amphibians. Have you noticed it with your bat stuff? Is there increased disease susceptibility with skin pH? <laughs> don't get me started on that. So we'll be here all day. But yes, that was one of my projects actually is looking at uh, different susceptibilities of bats. Like um, in white nose, uh, big browns are, and then uh, Christina's going to get mad if I use the wrong term here, but they don't die as much as little brown bats, for example, and they are also more acidic than little brown bats. But um, I haven't gone into those like cellular mechanisms of that yet, even for bats. So I, like, I can't speak at that level. Yeah. I think, did Aaron, did you have a question or did I already answer it? Um, but did you uh, also look at the age class and please maybe juveniles would be pushed more acidic environment than adults? 
Do you remember Tyler? Because I I don't know. Um, my memory, we didn't catch very many juveniles. Yeah. Because it was um, in the earlier part of the summer, we maybe moved on to that stuff later in the summer. So. <laughs> That's real. Yeah. Just to repeat for the uh, Zoom crowd, so they were catching juveniles in the early part of the summer when, when they were not at acidic sites, if I'm summarizing that correctly. Uh, no? But I don't think we caught very many juveniles at all. You just didn't c catch juveniles much. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Great. All good? In oh, areas, sorry. In areas like sort of Badlands, the part of Alberta and Seattle, where this waters are distinctly alkaline, uh, do you think that had, do you think that just presents a larger risk of, of, of infection or, or complications for skin pH? Like, is that why it might be more tricky for some of these organisms to live in those areas? So the question was, in um, Alberta, Badlands, and so forth, the water is a bit more alkaline, and that pr might present a higher disease risk. And I think it would. Um, like, you'd want to get more into the mechanisms of how exactly this does affect disease susceptibility and progression. Those are two different things. Um, but I would expect that because most of the microbes, not all actually, but most of them do function a little better in, in the slightly acidic range, the, uh, the enzymes that the microbes produce. So I would expect that to affect that. The disease uh, susceptibility, yes. Yeah. Um, so, hi, everybody. I'm Ginger. Uh, I am under uh, Dr. Amy Chabot, who works with African Lion Safari as an adjunct at Queen's, and Stephen Lohe with the Lohe Lab with Queen's University. So, we're going to talk a little bit today about assisted reproductive technologies for Canadian snake species. Um, which is a pretty new subject. And for Canadian snake species, it's entirely new. So uh, we just started about eight months ago and we did a year of preliminary work. But to introduce it, uh, assisted reproductive technologies is a technology that in some ways supports fertility. Now that can include, you know, we have birth control and you're limiting fertility, but also products like uh, in vitro fertilization. Um, specifically, my, progress, my project will be focusing on cryopreservation and what that can do. So you give a quick Google of prior preservation of semen. If you Google prior preservation of semen, you'll probably get about 50,000 results in less than a second. Uh, if you Google the cryopreservation of mammal semen, you can get somewhere close to 20,000 results in a, less than a second. Now, if I limit that to just farm animals, uh, that's 18,000 of those 20,000 results. We go down to fish, we got about 15,000 results in less than a second. Birds goes down to 5,000. <laughs> Amphibians have about 1,300 results. You got about 1,000 for reptiles in general, and then close to 500 if you're just Googling snake semen preservation. Now, a lot of those are going to be literature reviews about how there is no reviews on <laughs> this prior preservation of snake semen. So yeah, it's, there's not a lot going on, and I highly engage anyone who wants to do cryopreservation of snake species. We have 38 taxa, or 38 species to our extent, so I guess that doesn't, 36, lots of species. Um, so art specifically for snakes. As I said, there's not a lot going on. However, ultrasound investigations have shown that even in tropical areas, uh, snakes show reproductive seasonality, which is important. We're here in Canada. We're at the far north. Our animals are definitely going to show pronounced seasonality. It's something we want to look into. Now, semen collection was first published in 1980. It has been replicated across a series of family groups. We have been able to replicate it on 10 Canadian species um, without the use of an anesthetic, which for me is very important. I want to be able to make this technique transferable. Um, so in under 10 minutes, you should be able to get a semen sample without any anesthetics. Uh, and then, of course, as we've seen from all this dearth of literature, species-specific parameters affect cryopreservation success. Now, yes, they're all snakes, but here's just a picture of some mammal semen. And as you can see, it's vastly different. Not anyone, no one looks the same. And so all species sperm is expected to react specifically to different things. They all have their own qualities. And so conservation implications. Why is this important? So the um, art assisted reproductive technologies known as ART are going to be really important in the future with ex situ conservation, ex situ being in human managed care. So the northern white rhinos are managed by humans, even though they're in the situation, it's ex situ. So ex situ can target a few things. We can address primary threats, 
research, conservation, education. We can help offset the impact of small fragmented populations. We reintroduce species, we reinforce while we're dealing with the primary threats. We can restore wild populations with insurance populations and art. We've all heard about black-footed ferret and uh, Vancouver Island marmot. We're starting with the Eastern Massasauga. Um, and of course, we extend time to extinction. There are species that have gone completely extinct in the wild and we are maintaining them in captive care. However, where will art be valuable? Only specifically to these kind of two middle ones. We can do art research in captivity. However, it is going to help us offset the impacts of primary threats. By doing cryopreservation, we can help protect genetic variation of deceased individuals, and we can work on developing in vitro fertilization and sperm sorting techniques to allow for demographic and genetic augmentation of the populations in our care. Restoring wild populations, again, we're increasing the physicality of the ex situ conservation populations so that we can reintroduce and reinforce these species as we alleviate the primary threats, both have to happen, and we can introduce genetics back into the population using artificial insemination tech like in vitro fertilization. So I just started and it's a very broad project. So I'm not gonna talk to you about all my objectives today, but we are hoping to achieve three things, develop safe handling and collection for a range of species. The primary focus being Eastern Massasauga and gray rat snake, develop cryopreservation from that collection for this species at risk and potentially investigate gamete rescue from more mortally wounded snakes that we are running into on roads in Ontario. I'm just going to talk about one of my hypotheses today because that's a lot. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you about individual sperm production will vary throughout the year, my hypotheses, and I'll show you the results. And just mention a little bit that yes, different semen holding media has had individual effects on snake semen. So we're collecting a whole bunch of data to do this. You collect a range of parameters when you look at semen. It is a lot of counting to 100. I'll tell you that now. A <laughs> um, lot of percentages, a lot of looking at different points, and a lot of counting to 100 with a clicker. So join the team. You could, there's a lot of species. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to really quickly explain a violin plot for those who don't know how to read this. The line in the middle here, that is your median. 50% results above, 50% of the results are below. This is your interquartile range. So the um, on the extents of this gray line, okay, look, this is the first quartile. Will it do it again? Uh, nope. Okay, the bottom one would have gone, boom, that's the first quartile, and at the top is the third quartile. And now it pulsed. There you go. <laughs> and then this line is the rest of what would be an outlier because it's not falling within that interquartile range. And then violin plots. They're including a density estimation. So these wide areas are where we've got a lot of data, like a lot of results coming in. And the narrow ones, it's only a few data points in that area. Yay, we know what a violin plot is. Okay. <laughs> so to look at this, um, this is just looking at initial semen concentration. So when we collect a semen sample, we immediately look at what's considered raw. Um, now snake semen is super, super concentrated. So we can't exactly just look at it under a microscope or you would see static. So we do have to dilute it before we look at it and then make a calculation of concentration. So we have found that between the months, it's not too variable. Um, this is me counting. We're hoping to uh, improve to doing a automatic sperm uh, counter and then validate that with me counting. Um, but overall, the results uh, show a density around 5,000 sperm cells per microliter. Yeah, it's dense. <laughs> so that's exciting. We've had really good results for July and August, but we're hoping next year we'll have more thorough collection in each month going May through October and we'll get a better picture. Um, morphology. So using a stain, we are able to look at the morphology of the semen and whether they are normal or not. And uh, non-normal sperm, the tail breaks off, the head gets a droplet. It has curled around and tied itself to other sperm. So we did find that there are more morphologically normal sperm at the time of collection during the month of July. In August, things got a little crazy. The variability changed dramatically. And that could be because a lot of these snakes, well, the snake, gray rat snake and Eastern Massasauga are thought to breed when they come out of hibernation. We have so many questions that can be answered and so many things. So we're focusing just on what is the sperm doing? In July, there are more normal sperm than there are in August and it is more consistent. Uh, and then motility. So again, this is how they are moving. If there is 
out of 100 sperm, are all of them going somewhere? Is someone just sitting there? Now, motile can include something that is twitching. That is still a motile semen. We do give it a score on based on how it's moving, but this is just how it's moving. So you'll see a lot of the time we are actually getting that everything we collect and everything we see in the scope has movement. That's been really exciting. And it consistently is over 75%. So even those cells that have problems are moving. However, in July and August, it's a lot more variable. We started to get some non-motile cells coming out as well. So we just thought that was very interesting to note because it could be that it's dying in the reproductive tract. There's a lot of possibilities. <laughs> um, so I broke it down to just look at an individual animal. Uh, when you look at an individual animal, we are not yet in the exact same patterns. There's a lot more variability. So on the axes here, the first little bit, that's the 0% to 100% when you're looking at column A there, which is motility, and then all the way on the other end, you've got the viable sperm, those that are morphologically normal. And then at the very top, there's just notes of what the concentration was for two collections of that animal. Um, so this is one individual, and all the samples on the side are different samples we have been able to collect from this individual. Uh, unfortunately, he did not provide a semen sample in June, but we are using captive species. And after 10 minutes, that's that. So you'll see we didn't notice the same sort of trends. Again, species C, we've got the same axes, but we're not noticing an obvious trend in the data yet. So I'm hoping that potentially um, next year we'll have something more obvious, but we are seeming to see that uh, semen does vary between months within a single individual. So you can see the viability dropped. Um, yeah, so then just really quickly to touch on method development, because I thought it was really cool. Um, snake sperm is easily able to keep a straight line moving well for five days when kept in certain mediums in the fridge. So right now we're using four mediums. You can see that a score of one close to the bottom. That means those sperm are moving really good. They're going in a straight line. So you can see there's clear differences between the different types of media we're using. So if we're using uh, phosphate buffered saline, PBS, that's the third column, there's huge variability. Um, it's not consistent. It doesn't seem to have a reliable preservation of the semen. Whereas if you look on the other end at HEPIs, the bovine Sarah solution is able to support a lot more of the consistent movement over time when stored at four degrees in a fridge. Um, so this work is only possible because of amazing keepers all over Ontario. Um, I passed off a lot of the collection work at this point. So I just sit back and enjoy. Um, also all my supporters at Safari and in Lowheed Lab. So I really appreciate everything you guys do. Um, and then I have questions, but I thought it would just be fun to watch sperm while I, you ask. <laughs> I also have mousy sperm. That's next. Sorry. Yes, Alan. Um, yes, depending, but you have to have it in a media preservation. Otherwise, the cells explode and the DNA is no longer inside. Yes. Um, I noticed that you made a gloss over this potentially on purpose, but how do you distract sperm from the uh, You should talk to me about that later. <laughs> yes. We had to try a bunch of different um, ex like just bases to start with, like saline, phosphate buffered saline is very easy, um, low pH, like or pH of uh, seven, it's the same as, you know, uh, so I'm having a mind blank. I don't know all my pHs of my subjects, but we tried a variety of things. I did about a year of preliminary work before this, collecting semen from different snakes and then just diluting semen and seeing if it was consistently alive. Um, I've also, all of our medias are based off published medias and consultation. I say medias because, you know, I'll be talking to someone who's like, we tried this one that was made for horses. So that's what we do. Here, here, you want to see the, the other semen? Yeah, there you go. There, see the quality is me. I'm frustrated with the masses. Anyway, <laughs> there's another one. Yeah, 
Um, I can ask you so many questions. <laughs> um, you had explained to us the density of the sperm. Sarah, I think if you can go just this talk to see if you have time. Yeah. Mm -hmm, yeah. The, oh, no, you're the good. You're good. Yeah, answer is questions. Really interesting to me because in theory, it doesn't require a cell. So, do you have? Do you have thoughts? About I have lots. Is it just that sperm thoughts. is cheap, or um, so there. I mean, there's 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 lots of things. Uh, snake semen is very similar to bird semen in a lot of ways. Um, I have lots of theories. I mean, I almost played a video for you of the Masseys actually doing the do, and you'll notice that they really lock in, and he's in there for a long time. Now, if you look at something like a dog, when they lock in, it's because their seminal quality is really bad. I don't know if anyone's seen rat snakes going out in the wild. I've never got a good view, but I'm now starting to think that it's a faster process. If you walk in, you've got poor quality semen, you can get as much as it is in there. If it's not great, then there's a better shot. Um, but it could also be a uh, strategy to reduce competition. So yeah. there's so many questions and everyone should join Snake Arts. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ginger. Thanks for coming to my talk today. I'm Jess, I'm a PhD candidate in the Red Path Museum in the Green Lab over at McGill University. If you picked up a coloring book at registration, I am also the author and illustrator of that. <laughs> Thank you. I'm happy to talk more about that later, but right now we're going to talk about tadpoles. And my, everyone's like, yes, good. Um, my, and my three years of data I have on these tadpoles that I study and how they differ from one another. So a lot of times when we're researching tadpoles and we're studying them, we're looking at how things affect tadpoles, aspects of their environment um, and how that's changing their ecology and their behavior, things like that. But my research flips this around and instead looks at how tadpoles affect things. So how different aspects of the environment change when tadpoles are present or when they are absent. Specifically, I look at nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus, algal communities like phytoplankton and periphyton, and zooplankton communities, and how these change when these tadpoles are there or not. I do this using experimental mesocosms located in Long Point, Ontario, um, and these mesocosms are either filled with American toad tadpoles, Fowler's toad tadpoles, both those together, or no tadpoles at all. So I can look at differences between all these different communities um, and see how they're changing the ecology of the systems that they're in. And all of these mesocosms mimic the natural ecosystems that the toads live in in Long Point. So I collect samples from all these different aspects of the environment using my very scientific instruments like a toothbrush and a turkey baster mm -hmm. to collect algal samples. We pack these up back to the lab, bring them to McGill um, and see how these environments differ. But there's some differences we can see before we even get back to the lab and do any analysis. These two mesocosms are exactly the same. I set them up in the same way I, they have the same amount of sunlight, they have the same substrate, they were stocked with the same things. The only difference is that this one has no tadpoles in it and it never has, and the one next to it has 100 Fowler's toad tadpoles in it in this case. And you can see this huge visual difference um, in those ecosystems already. We know there's more algae. When there's no tadpoles, we can see that it's much more green. And we're not just seeing this in the mesocosms. We're also seeing this in natural ponds. So this is just a little bit north of Long Point in Fort Rowan, Ontario. That's like a 10 minute drive up from our field site. Um, and this is a satellite view of two ponds. The lower one has thousands of American toad tadpoles in it. And the upper one, the toads decided they didn't want to breed in it that year. Set up this lovely little natural experiment for us. And you can see the same visual difference in algal biomass. It's much more green when the tadpoles are absent from these ecosystems. When we do get back to the lab, we find more differences. So these are net effects from 2018 of tadpole. Um, absence and presence. So when tadpoles were not in these ecosystems, phosphorus varied a lot more through time, algal biomass was higher, as we would expect, and zooplankton diversity was lower. Those are really big differences cascading across entire ecosystems just when these tadpoles are present or when they are absent. And that's really interesting, but it turns out that's not actually the end of the story. So my 2018 results are really cool, but Variance was really high between the mesocosms. And this makes sense. Um, these mesocosms are independent systems. They're all evolving independently of each other. Um, these ecosystems are establishing differently. But still, we wanted more replicates. We wanted to tease apart more what was happening. We also wanted to know what was happening in these natural ponds um, because we didn't have the same kind of samples that we had from them as we did from the mesocosm. So we wanted to know more what was occurring there. We got lots of unexpected results we wanted to know more about, like what's happening in these mixed species mesocosms that I'm going to talk to you more about in a little bit. So let's do it again. 
We'll go repeat the experiment in 2019, do the same thing, get some more replicates, and see what's happening in these mesocosms. That was our plan anyway. 2019 had some different plans for us. Um, it was the wettest year on record in Southern Ontario. This first image you see here is a road that we usually would use to drive to the field site. We had to park the car and walk. The second image is supposed to be a campground. It's all flooded out. We couldn't study independent natural ponds. It was all just one pond, uh, <laughs> Long Point, Ontario. Um, so we didn't, while well, everything I did was the same, the ecosystem that these uh, mesocosms are in were not. And that affected the results that we got in these mesocosms. So while in 2018, we had these really beautiful clear net effect differences, in 2019, not so much. Phosphorus didn't vary through time the same way. Algal um, biomass was, was higher when tadpoles were absent, but not to the same extent. And zooplankton diversity was lower, but again, not to the same extent. And it seems like the rain just kind of diluted out a lot of the effects that the tadpoles had um, in these systems. We didn't see the same thing. That's interesting on its own, that precipitation is affecting how these species are interacting with these ecosystems around them. But it led us to even more questions. Was 2019 just a super weird year with all this rain? Um, was it not representative of what would normally be happening? With the natural ponds flooded out, we still couldn't tell what was going on there. And we only got more unanswered questions. And by this point, I was starting to think that maybe the question of, oh, what do tadpoles do, actually might have more than one answer. So let's go back again. We'll come back one more time. We'll repeat the experiment in 2021. 2020 is skipped for obvious reasons we will not discuss. <laughs> Went back again um, in 2021 to see what's happening. And I'm still working through um, the community data there, but um, spoiler alert, it is different again in a third new way. But what I'm going to talk to you about briefly is um, what's actually going on between the tadpole species. So I mentioned we have some mesocosms that have both tadpoles in them at the same time. So American toads and Fowler's toads both present together. American toads and Fowler's toads both live in Long Point, Ontario. Usually they breed in different sites, but they can breed in the same ones um, and they even can hybridize. So sometimes their breeding choruses get mixed together. Fowler's toads, our beloved Fowler's toads, are endangered in Canada. They are sand dune specialists that are at their range edge up here and they breed in mid-May. American toads are stable generalist species with a large range and they breed in early May. Um, so we thought they would have a bit of a competitive advantage over the Fowler's toads. We measured this competitive advantage using um, survivorship to metamorphosis, weight at metamorphosis, and time to metamorphosis, which are all fitness proxies for tadpoles. And in 2018, American toads certainly had this advantage over Fowler's toads because almost all the Fowler's toads died in the mesocosms with the American toads in them. We only had 22% survival. It was abysmal. In 2021, under the exact same conditions as far as we could provide them, that didn't happen. 98% of the Fowler's toadlets that were raised with American toadlets lived. They did just fine. When we look at toadlet weight, though, there's a different story. So um, in 2018, Fowler's toadlets that emerged from mixed species mesocosms were significantly larger than their single species counterparts. And in 2021, we flipped that again. The species, the Fowler's toads that emerged from mixed species mesocosms were significantly smaller than their single species counterparts that importantly were raised at the same density as them. So that it had a negative effect. The American toad presence had a negative effect on Fowler's toads in both years, but the way that effect presented itself was different. So everything's different. Each year had different results from everything from the aquatic community to species interactions within the same guild between years. And these were in our semi-controlled outdoor mesocosms where everything I did was the same. And these are probably an underestimate of what's happening in the real ecosystems. Yeah, sorry, we just jammed. There we go. Okay, so these, um, this one, there we go. These two pictures, are of um, the, the area we work in Long Point, Ontario. This first one is from 2019, where this flooded ATV track is our only suitable breeding habitat for the toads. And this is 2021, hugely different. We have ecosystems that are shallow, sandy pools that didn't even exist in um, 2019. So these, it's a hugely variable ecosystem. We're probably actually underestimating the amount of variability happening. So you've probably heard this quote before, that the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. Um, it's been attributed to Einstein. Now we say it's been misattributed to Einstein. 
I say whoever said this was not an ecologist. <laughs> um, so I had the same thing over and over again, each time I got a different result. And by the end, I started to expect that. So just to wrap up why these are so different, um, we're often told to make sure our experiments are replicable, but we hardly ever actually repeat experiments. In fact, only 5% of field experiments get repeated across multiple years, but of those, 75% show significant interannual variation. These are changes in year effects like precipitation, the weather, frost dates, droughts, and water levels mm -hmm. that can all change how species interact with one another. They can also change just by chance, by who shows up in these ecosystems first and who develops and who's more dominant. So we know that ecosystems are affecting these tadpoles and how they're interacting with each other. We know tadpoles are affecting these ecosystems and we know our new friend yearly conditions is affecting all of this. So my simple question of what do tadpoles do turns out wasn't so simple. So species interactions can vary from year to year. This is especially true in highly variable and ephemeral systems. It could be due to year effects, seasonally entrained chaos, or just by chance. And we really need to consider the value of repeating our experiments across multiple years to capture a full scope of species interactions. This isn't just noise. It's a feature, not a flaw in these ecosystems. We need to pay attention to it. And one year of a study is really only part of our story. I need to thank everyone, including my lovely lab, my volunteers, and the toads. And I'd love to take your questions. Sorry, how do I get the data to... Confirm the trend. Confirm. If every year is different, how do you confirm there's a trend? I think you need a lot of years. I think is the answer. And I, of course, I don't have a lot of years. I know that within my years, the trends I see are real, right? Like they're, they're high, there's high variance, but they're still real trends. So I can say, like, okay, within that year that happened, within this year, this happened. I think you need a much larger data set than I have or lots of fun collaborations um, to actually establish like what the long-term trends are. Oh, yeah. Okay. Apologies that I missed this one. Yeah, so um, repeating it for Zoom, how do I inoculate or set up the mesocosm so that they replicate the natural environment? So I use natural sand. The, um, the natural ponds there have sand substrates. I'm using the same sand as a substrate, which you would think would have very low nutrients, but in long point mysteriously doesn't. Um, I'm also inoculating it with the natural pond biota. And I set these up in early May, which is the same time that those ponds are establishing in long point. So I'm really mimicking them. And we are not adding any other food. The tadpoles are eating just like the periphyton that is growing in those tanks naturally from that inoculation. Yeah, so the question was, do the adults select these different sites that they're putting the tadpoles in? And they they do um, sometimes select them very poorly, especially when there aren't sites that are actually available for them. So um, like I showed you that flooded ATV trail that was like the only suitable breeding habitat. It wasn't suitable enough for the adults to actually choose it. We just knew the tadpoles would probably survive there. So that year, the only breeding that happened was in a gravel puddle in a parking lot that later got filled in. Um, we rescued those. They're fine. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, they do they do try to make these selective choices of where they're putting the eggs. There there absolutely could be parental differences between the years, especially because we, oh, my hair is interfering with my um, especially because the uh, so Fowler's toads now are doing a little bit better and they're actually doing breeding forces. The first two years of my study, they weren't. There were no breeding forces. There was like ever one male calling. There was only ever one clutch of eggs. So I don't have genetic diversity. There wasn't any. Um, so there could definitely be differences between the parents in the year and that causing some of the differences we're seeing. However, they would still be the relevant ecological differences because there was one clutch of eggs in our field site, which is like most of Long Point, um, at least in the accessible part. And so that would still be the tadpoles that would have been in the wild that year would only have been from that one clutch. All right, so uh, for everyone who doesn't know me, my name is Steph Thibault. I'm a master's student in the Litskis lab in Sudbury, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of my research investigating sexual dichromatism in Ontario spotted turtles. So these are spotted turtles, um, and they exhibit a pretty interesting biological phenomenon called sexual dichromatism, uh, also known as sexual color dimorphism. So this is when uh, both sexes of the same species have very different colors. And spotted turtles actually exhibit something called ontogenetic dichromatism, and this is usually a permanent change in color at some point in their lives. 
uh, usually associated with sexual maturity. And uh, from what you can see from the picture, uh, the male there on the uh, the right bears a dark brown chin and brown to black eyes, while females bear these bright orange chins and orange eyes. Uh, but while this has been known for decades in the herpetology community, no one has really tried to elucidate the significance or the, the functional role of this trait, right? Um, so what exactly could be the role of one of these traits? So a little bit of a bio lesson here. Um, so over millions of years, certain species um, have uh, developed morphological differences between the sexes, and this can be in size, in ornaments, and in some, it's in color. And color is often uh, attributed to mate attraction. Uh, and a well-known example that we probably all know is what happens with many birds, where males develop this bright breeding plumage during the breeding season. And you may have noticed that typically these traits arise in the male sex. However, in spotted turtles, it's actually the reverse situation. So uh, the females are actually the ones with the more conspicuous colors, right? And while this is pretty uncommon in the animal kingdom, it can happen. Uh, and they so fittingly call this a sex role reversal. And a really well-known uh, example, but kind of extreme example, is what happens in seahorses, where females kind of, uh, quote-unquote, impregnate the male, and uh, the male kind of gives a pseudo-birth to his little offspring, right? So it kind of begs the question, uh, do male spotted turtles choose to mate with the brightest colored females? And I hypothesize that they do. And I'm testing this uh, using 3D models. So very much inspired by Greg Wilte's study with the map turtles. Um, I designed three 3D models and printed them and got them painted to resemble males and females. So I have three models, one of which resembles a male and the other two resemble females. Uh, one has a duller chin than the other. So, And what we're doing with these models is essentially presenting them to males in situ in these controlled behavior behavioral trials in an enclosure, and then we record the males' uh, behaviors with a GoPro setup. So currently, I've done some trials uh, in this past spring, and I'm actually in the process of doing more this fall and planning on doing more next spring as well. So what exactly do I do with all of this turtle pornography? Um, so essentially what we can do is I can categorize these behaviors uh, into a binary outcome. So we can look at neutral and then mating behavior, right? And with a binary outcome, um, we can analyze this with a logistic regression. Um, and on the x-axis, you can see that we can look at color brightness, while on the y-axis, we look at the probability of displaying uh, mating behavior, right? And so why exactly am I doing this? Well, again, no study has tried to uncover the functional role of this trait in the species. And it's actually also the first mate choice experiment that we know of that's been used uh, on spotted turtles. Um, and of course, this could also give us more insight into turtle evolution and uh, the weirdness that is sex role reversals in the animal kingdom, right? Um, and then for those of you that aren't aware, spotted turtles are endangered provincially, federally, and globally. And one of the leading causes to their declines is illegal capture for the pet trade, also known as poaching. And so there are some implications that kind of come with this study. So if we think outside of the box, if males do choose to uh, mate with brighter females, then we can speculate that these brighter females uh, would be very fit, should be having more offspring than other females, right? And poachers love to take the very pretty animals. Uh, so if poachers are taking these prettier, brighter females, then they're actually exacerbating population declines more than we were previously aware. And so with understanding uh, these trends, we can better understand the declines that this endangered species has been facing uh, in recent decades and continues to face to this day. Um, I'd like to thank everyone that's been helping me with the project. I hope to have more for you next year when this is all done. Uh, and thank you very much for listening. Okay, hello. Uh, my name is Rachel, and I'm here from the Eco Hydrology Lab at McMaster, where I am currently doing my master's thesis. But this is not related to that, so maybe next year will be the time for me to present some of my own research. But today I am presenting um, some of the eco hydrological characteristics that we've seen in Massasauga ha uh, habitat. Um, that has been impacted by wildfire. 
Okay, so wildfire is a natural uh, uh, disturbance, uh, but we've been seeing that with climate change and human pressures, that wildfire is on the rise. And I think this year, especially, that's something that we've seen here in Canada. Um, and we need to be um, more um, paying more attention to uh, the impacts of wildfire and what that means um, for the future of reptile species, especially. Um, so uh, my research group does a lot of work in the Eastern Georgian Bay area. Um, and back in 2018, we had the Perry Sound 33 wildfire, which burned a massive area, and that included critical habitat for the Eastern Massasauga rattlesnake. Um, so we do a lot of our research in the peatlands in this area, and it just so happens that these Massasaugas overwinter in these peatlands. And so we apply this notion of the resilience zone, which is the space between the water table and the zero degree Celsius isotherm. Um, so basically that's providing uh, conditions that are both unflooded and unfrozen. So what we did was we quantified this resilience zone at the burned peatlands. Um, we wanted to look at both the microhabitat and macrohabitat spatial scale. So at the microhabitat level, we were looking at hummocks across a gradient of different burn severities to see how that might influence resilience zone dynamics. And then at the macrohabitat scale, we were looking at the hummocks from these peatlands as a whole and comparing the burned peatlands against other um, natural peatlands within that region. Um, and this is what the uh, setup looked like. So we had a thermocouple profile, which was measuring temperatures at multiple depths below the hummock surface in order to keep track of the position of the zero degree Celsius isotherm. And we had a groundwater well tracking the water table. So first, thing, first things first, uh, we found that at the microhabitat scale, we did see that the resilience zone differed by burn severity. And interestingly, it was the moderately burned hummocks that actually maintained the largest resilience zone size and ma maintained that resilience zone for the greatest proportion of that overwintering period. And so they were performing even better than the um, unburned reference hummocks that were in unburned peatlands. And then zooming out and looking at the macro habitat scale, uh, we did find that these burn sites were also performing better than the unburned peatlands overall. Um, if you do look more closely, these plots are divided by overwintering periods. And so you'll notice that that first winter from 2019 to 2020, that the two different site types are a little bit more comparable. But from 2020 onwards, those unburned sites are maintaining that larger resilience zone and um, maintaining that for a greater proportion of the winter. Um, and then if we break that down and look more at the water, what the water table and zero degrees Celsius isotherm is doing, we find that water table seems to be the key driver of those resilience zone dynamics. And we notice that the water table seems to be much deeper at the burned sites. And there is also a correspondence between the depth of that water table and the burn severity that those sites experienced. Um, so there are a couple different reasons why that might be. Um, at these burned peatlands, you're going to have a reduced canopy and less vegetation. So that would result in higher rates of evaporation or sublimation during the winter time when there's snow on the ground. Um, if there is a loss of peat because that has burned away, then we might also expect to see faster peatland water drainage because there's less peat there to retain the water. Um, and then we also know that the depth of burn in those burn sites varies. Um, hummocks especially are quite resilient against fire. And so they're going to experience less depth of burn compared to their surroundings. So even when they have that loss of peat, it's not going to be as dramatic as their surroundings. And so we might actually see them grow taller relative to the depressions immediately next to them. And so that might uh, buffer against some of the um, water table rise that might happen at certain points during the winter time. 
So all this to say that wildfire has a lot of different impacts on the environment and that has consequences for um, all of the reptiles that use this environment. And that is everything that I had for you. Uh, so thank you for attending. My name is Alex Jardine. I'm a recent graduate of Carleton University, actually. I finished my master's in 2022. Uh, so funny enough, this is my first presentation in front of a live audience, despite having done an entire degree here. Uh, <laughs> uh, but nonetheless, I work in the Aquatic Ecosystems and Environmental Change now uh, Lab now with Jesse Vermeer, where I do a lot of work on microplastics in wildlife and the environment. And this is a joint project between us and uh, Laurentian University and David, who's here with us today. So... Um, I'm sure that everybody by now is aware that uh, microplastics and plastic pollution has become a pretty uh, noticeable or a pretty significant threat to ecosystems and the environment. So I'll, I'll uh, give you the spiel anyway, but uh, no, no news here, really. Um, the production of plastic can really be attributed to uh, following the Second World War. When it really took off, it was used in a lot of uh, equipment and produced for uh, tools of warfare as well as in medical equipment. And, and then in the 50s, it saw another significant boom where it increased to about 1.5 million tons produced every year. And then as of 2017, that has, of course, skyrocketed to 348 millions of ton million tons of plastic produced every year. So all of this plastic obviously has to end up somewhere and 29 million tons per year do unfortunately end up in our terrestrial and aquatic uh, ecosystems. And this can have a myriad of uh, negative effects for wildlife, as I'm sure you're all aware, uh, particularly for amphibians, who are, of course, uh, many of which are critically endangered and uh, importantly, throughout their life cycles, occupy both or uh, our terrestrial and aquatic systems. So this predisposes them to multiple pathways of ingestion. So uh, we decided to take a look at the northern leopard frogs, which are of course a very common throughout Ontario to answer two main questions. First of which, does the amount of microplastics ingested vary between presumed low plastic concentration sites and presumed high concentration plastic sites, as well as whether or not there was a relationship between the morphology of the frogs and how many plastics they were eating. So we had five study sites, two of which were presumed to be of high disturbance, thus those higher traffic areas with a lot of anthropogenic activity, and three low disturbance sites, uh, which were more rural and uh, less uh, occupied. So total six, uh, sorry, a total of six frogs were collected from each site for a total of 30. So uh, first, the morphological measurements were taken, uh, both the external and internal measurements of the gastrointestinal tract, the weight and length as well. And the GI tracts were then removed and digested in a 10% potassium hydroxide solution, which removes a lot of the organic material and leaves behind the inorganic stuff like plastics. Then the suspected microparticles were extracted and then sent to Carleton University, where I analyzed them using FTIR, which is a Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy. And essentially what that does is it gives you an infrared spectrum of the particle that you are assessing. And uh, circled here are the, the peaks that would coincide with spectrum that are pre-recorded in a database where you could essentially compare your particle to pre-existing spectra and uh, determine both the identity of a particle as well as whether or not it is plastic. So out of the 30 total microplastics that we suspect, or microparticles that we suspected as plastic, 14 were confirmed to be plastic, which was 46% of the total. However, if we also include those plastics, which had a weak detection, but most of the results were suggested as plastic, then it was actually 53% of the total suspected particles. Uh, we had eight particles from high contaminated sites with a max of five in one frog, and six from the low contamination sites with a max of four in one frog. However, when we compared the two sites with uh, an ANOVA test and a, and a pardon me, a one-way ANOVA and a Tukey test, we found that they were not significant. The difference between the two was not significant at 0 0.05, but this can kind of be expected with these uh, relatively small sample sizes. Uh, however, when we looked at the maximum amount of plastics for each site, uh, there was a pretty noticeable difference in the standard deviation, uh, as well as when you consider the fact that we had less sites for higher contaminated sites um, or yeah, less sampling sites for higher contamination zones, uh, the maximum number and total number of plastics was in fact higher. When it comes to the morphology of the frog, there didn't really appear to be any noticeable differences uh, or no significant relationships between the morphologies of the frogs and the number of uh, plastics ingested. So we had things like the weight and length of the GI tract as well as the uh, snout vein length of the frog. Uh, none of that seemed to make a difference. 
so we kind of conclude based on those results that uh, the ingestion of microplastics is more so driven by the environment rather than the morphology of the frog. And uh, individuals living in higher disturbance sites have at face value at least a higher incidence of microplastics in their GI tract. And we're further exploring this hypothesis, both through quantifying the uh, microplastic concentration in the soils from the sites, as well as adding new study sites to uh, sort of even the playing field between the two groups. I'd like to uh, acknowledge Noah Loisel, who was the project lead on this, and uh, most of this work is based off of his undergraduate thesis, uh, as well as the uh, many wonderful uh, contributors and supporters of this project and sources of funding and uh, whatnot. So, thank you. You're